Hello, my dear children. Namaste and welcome to a brand new series. Finally, yes, the much awaited one shot series is right here for you. And today we get started with your very first chapter in biology, which is life processes for CBSE class 10 students in one shot. This is Ambika, your biology master teacher, right here on this amazing platform of Vedantu. Okay, guys, so just in case you have not subscribed to our channel yet, please do click on the subscribe button right now because as you already know, we are coming closer and closer towards the end of your academic year, right? So your syllabus has been done. ICSE 10, of course, we still have a couple of chapters remaining, but CBSE 9 and 10, we are done with the syllabus and we have already given you uh, Bio Bites in 15 Minutes, which is a series which uh, I have really been happy with the kind of response that you all uh, have been coming up with, the kind of feedback also that you all have been giving me. So very, very happy to know that it's been helping you out. So for class nine, it's still ongoing. ICSE 10, not to worry at all. It's still uh, in store for you. OK, so let's first aim at completing the syllabus. So today we are getting started with the chapter in one shot. Life processes the entire chapter in a shot, which will help you when it comes to quickly revising the entire chapter from one single video. OK, so do remember that because it's going to be a chapter in one shot here. Also, we won't be going into the absolute details of the chapter because we've already done that in our main list of videos. So in case you are learning these chapters for the very first time, hopefully you're not OK. Do check out the main playlist and watch the videos in depth to understand all the concepts. OK, so today we'll just be I aim to just uh, brush up all the concepts in the chapter life processes so that it will help you out either in any uh, quick upcoming exam happening tomorrow, today or within the next few days. Uh, and that's about it. OK, and as always, We'll start with a positive quote. There are no shortcuts to any place worth going. So do remember that. OK, no shortcuts to success is what I wanted to let you know. That's about it. OK, so in this chapter, as you already know, there are four important life processes that we talk about. Nutrition and digestion is the first one. Breathing and respiration would be the second one. Circulation is the third one and excretion is the fourth one. These are the processes that we discuss in this chapter, but of course in plants and in animals. So let us first get started with the revision of nutrition and digestion at a glance. Okay, types of nutrition, if you remember, you can say that uh, there are two major modes of nutrition, autotrophic and heterotrophic. Autotrophic is the mode of nutrition wherein um, organisms can prepare their own food from simple inorganic substances in nature. Mainly the processes by which uh, autotrophs carry out this preparation of uh, food is by photosynthesis or by chemosynthesis, if you remember. So always remember auto means self and trophos means nutrition and heteros would mean others, which means these organisms depend on other organisms for their food. So heterotrophic organisms can be categorized under three different groups, depending upon what they eat, depending upon what kind of food they eat. Um, some of them prefer to feed on dead and decaying organic matter, and we call them saprophytic organisms. And the best examples are bacteria and fungi. Okay, Many, many fungi especially are examples of saprophytes. And then coming to parasitic organisms, which Literally, they are parasites, hold on to cling on to a host organism and derive all the nutrients from the host organism without necessarily killing the organism. This is what we mean by parasitic mode of nutrition. So they can either be ectoparasites or they can be endoparasites, which means they can either be outside the body of the host or inside the body of the host. Okay. Then the last type of heterotrophic nutrition is holozoic nutrition for which human beings are a very good example wherein the entire food material, liquid or solid food material is ingested and then intracellular digestion happens. So in addition to human beings, even simple unicellular organisms like amoeba are an example for holozoic mode of nutrition. Okay, so this is the gist of the categorization of the kinds of nutrition. Okay. So now coming to photosynthesis, as you know, this is the process by which plants 
green plants and some bacteria also are able to synthesize organic molecules from simple inorganic raw materials such as carbon dioxide and water in the presence of sunlight or sun's energy and using chlorophyll which is a magical green pigment that they have to produce yes as i have told you organic molecules such as glucose okay another important thing to remember here is that um, as far as photosynthesis is concerned carbon dioxide co2 is taken in and oxygen is given out okay takes in carbon dioxide and uh, gives out oxygen okay so oxygen which is given out in photosynthesis acts as the life sustaining gas on our planet supporting all of us okay so the end products of photosynthesis would be glucose and oxygen okay so this is all about photosynthesis now coming to nutrition in amoeba which is an example of holozoic mode of nutrition there are five major steps starting with ingestion even in our body all these five steps happen but the only difference is because we are a much more complex organism it occurs um, in a different manner there are different parts of our body associated with it but then in amoeba it's a unicellular organism so that single cell takes care of all these steps starting with ingestion wherein the pseudopodia are ingesting they are engulfing the food particle and just eating it up ingestion refers to eating okay second is digestion once the food has been eaten the next step would be to digest it that happens next once the food has been digested the nutrients have to be absorbed from it and then what what after absorption it would be utilization of the nutrients for the various metabolic activities that is what we mean by assimilation which is step 4 of holozoic nutrition and comes step 5 which is elimination of the undigested food material which we call ejection not excretion remember it is ejection which is the opposite of ingestion okay so these are the major steps of holozoic mode of nutrition especially what you see here is how it occurs in amoeba now coming to the human digestive system in which also as i told you it is holozoic mode of nutrition these are the different parts associated with our much needed and the most useful i well i would say most useful but even then um, there is our heart there is our lungs also which are equally important but one of our most useful systems digestive system starting with the buccal cavity going through what we call the pharynx esophagus stomach small intestine and the large intestine okay and in the meantime there are also accessory structures such as the liver and the pancreas which are also essential to add in their digestive juices to complete the process of digestion in our alimentary canal okay so remember uh, the term alimentary canal refers to this entire tube which starts with the buccal cavity and ends in the anus okay alimentary cavity or uh, the gut as we can also call it so starting with the buccal cavity inside our buccal cavity we've got the muscular tongue we've got the teeth we've got the salivary glands pouring in their secretions so what happens is uh, the food gets broken down uh, mechanically by our teeth and also salivary glands contain salivary amylase which helps in digestion of starch okay starch is broken down up to a certain extent complex carbohydrates like starch are broken down up to a certain extent inside the buccal cavity so carbohydrate digestion begins in the buccal cavity okay so these are the different chemical actions which occur in the buccal cavity so as i have told you the starch which is uh, insoluble right now with the action of under the action of salivary amylase gets broken down into relatively simpler sugars inside the buccal cavity so proteins fats and all of them don't undergo digestion in the buccal cavity then comes the esophagus which is this food pipe acts as the connecting pipeline to carry the <coughs> partially broken down food from the mouth into the stomach so that is your esophagus and in the stomach what happens these are the major secretions inside the stomach we together uh, collectively we call it gastric juices which comprise of um hcl hydrochloric acid um pepsin which helps in protein digestion and mucus which provides protection to the stomach walls 
HCl, as you know, is a highly concentrated acid with a very, very low pH. There are two major advantages for it. One is that it facilitates pepsin's action. It is because of that low pH that pepsin is able to become active. And another function of HCl is also to kill or eliminate germs which may have accidentally entered along with the food. And then comes pepsin which uh, helps in protein digestion up to an extent. And then mucus, of course, which provides protection from the acidic action of HCl. Okay, so these are what happen inside your stomach. Now comes the small intestine. The partially digested food from the stomach enters into the small intestine. And in the small intestine, this is actually, you can say that it's the final uh, area, the final area of digestion. Okay. And also absorption occurs here. Absorption of the nutrients also occurs in the small intestine. So in the small intestine, there are three major secretions. One is, of course, the secretions of the small intestine walls themselves, which we call intestinal juice. Okay. Then also the secretions of the liver and the pancreas are received in the small intestine. Liver secretes bile, which helps in fat emulsification. Okay, now this is important children, even for a one mark question to know what bile does. Just think of it, it doesn't digest fats, but it breaks down or emulsifies fat. Pretty much like how soap would break down oil on your hands once you have eaten something really oily using your hands. Okay, and then pancreas secretes pancreatic juice, which contains two major parts, uh, two major components, trypsin, which helps in protein digestion and lipase, which helps in fat digestion. Okay, so this is what happens in the small intestine and also the intestinal juice completes the process of digestion inside the small intestine. And then, of course, the next step is absorption. Um, the small intestinal walls are inner walls of the small intestine are highly, uh, are made up of highly folded structures, which are called villi, microvilli, which greatly help in increasing the surface area for absorption. So these villi, as you can see, are richly provided with blood capillaries. All these red and blue uh, wire-like structures are all the blood capillaries. Uh, the blood vessels which are associated with the villi and as a result they are able to readily absorb the nutrients from the small intestine into the bloodstream and from there they transport it to large distances to all the different cells of your body. So these are the end products of uh, digestion that you can see here. Carbohydrates are ultimately broken down to glucose, proteins to amino acids, fats into fatty acids and glycerol, the end products of various macromolecules. Macromolecules are huge molecules like carbohydrates, proteins and fats. Okay, now These end products are formed in the small intestine. So now coming to the large intestine, what does that do? The last part of your uh, elementary canal, undigested food, anything that is left undigested in the small intestine moves further down the gut into the large intestine. And there, walls of the large intestine absorb excess water and fecal matter get eliminated through the anus, temporarily stored in the rectum and ultimately eliminated through the anus. We call this process egestion. Do remember once again, it is not excretion, it is egestion. Okay, so that is about nutrition and digestion. Now moving on to the next one, which is respiration. In fact, it's a continuation of this because I've already told you that End products of digestion are glucose, uh, amino acids, fatty acids and glycerol. So what exactly is respiration? The process by which energy can be derived from various nutrients. Okay, so especially glucose being the best source of energy, the immediate source of energy among all the end products of digestion, we say that respiration is the breakdown of glucose to release energy in living cells. Okay, so this is it. There are two major kinds of respiration, aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic wherein oxygen is involved, anaerobic which occurs in the absence of oxygen. So uh, anaerobic can be observed in lower organisms like yeasts and all of that. Those are examples. Um, and these are the major steps in respiration. Children, this is also another very, very, very important uh, flow chart as far as your exams are concerned. You have to know this very, very well. Think about it. 
the glucose, which I have told you as the end product of carbohydrate digestion, it enters into the different trillion cells of your body. Um, and once it reaches the cytoplasm of the target cells, it gets converted to pyruvate, which is a three carbon molecule. Two molecules of pyruvate are generated from one molecule of glucose, okay, along with energy. And then this always happens, okay, this is a compulsory step that always happens in all kinds of respiration, aerobic or anaerobic. Whereas after this, pyruvate can take up any of these three pathways, depending upon which organism it occurs in and depending upon the condition in the cells there. For example, in the case of anaerobic organisms such as yeast, this pyruvate gets converted to ethanol or alcohol and releases carbon dioxide and energy. Whereas normally inside our body cells, when there is an abundance of oxygen, because we keep inhaling oxygen, right? So in the presence of oxygen, what happens is this pyruvate would enter into mitochondria. So if this is your cell, this is the nucleus, this you can say is the mitochondria and there are various other organelles also inside the cell. Um, so glucose to pyruvate conversion occurs in the cytoplasm. This pyruvate enters into the mitochondria and in the mitochondria it gets converted to carbon dioxide water and energy this is what happens in aerobic respiration whereas in cases where such as in the case of our muscle cells where there is a shortage of oxygen or a lack of oxygen um, what happens is the pyruvate instead of taking pathway number three it takes an alternative pathway which is pathway two here wherein it gets converted into lactic acid and energy, okay? And too much accumulation of lactic acid results in what we call muscle cramps, yes? So these are the steps in respiration. And in plants, we know that uh, it is in photosynthesis that carbon dioxide is taken in and oxygen is released. Whereas in respiration, just like in the case of human beings, oxygen is taken in and carbon dioxide is given out even in plants, Okay, the only thing to remember is that during the daytime, photosynthesis, okay, just a second. Yeah, during the daytime, uh, photosynthesis and uh, respiration both occur. Whereas in the nighttime, only respiration occurs because obviously photosynthesis requires sunlight. So that, that doesn't occur during the nighttime. Okay, so now, uh, of course, different organisms have their own mechanisms of respiration. In aquatic organisms like fishes, uh, they take in water through the mouth and then that uh, passes over the gill filaments and from there the oxygen uh, is taken into the blood uh, vessels and carbon dioxide is given out. Okay? Different organisms have their own mechanisms of respiration. Now when it comes to breathing in humans, inhalation and exhalation, right? Uh, two major phases of breathing inhalation and is exhalation. So when you inhale, what happens is the oxygen from outside gets pushed into your lungs. So in order to make up more space for your lungs, your diaphragm would contract. Your diaphragm would actually go below and contract. The chest would end up expanding and the air is completely filling up inside your lungs. This happens in inhalation. Whereas in exhalation, the reverse happens, wherein the diaphragm is relaxing, the chest is coming back to its normal size and air flows out of your lungs through your nostrils. This is inhalation and exhalation. And these are the major parts of the respiratory system in humans. I'm sure you, you guys already know this, uh, starting with the nasal passage, but the nasal cavity um, going into the, um, the pharynx once again, which is a common passage between digestive system and the respiratory system. This is followed by the voice box or the larynx, followed by the trachea or the windpipe. And then further down, it splits up into the right and left bronchi, which enter into the right lung and the left lung respectively. Of course, remember, the lungs are protected by the ribcage. And below the lungs, the diaphragm is there for added support. 
and of course into the once it enters inside the lungs the bronchi split up uh, divide further into primary bronchioles secondary bronchioles tertiary bronchioles and finally into air sacs called alveoli that is where there is rich supply of blood vessels as you see here and diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide occurs between the alveoli and the blood capillaries this is what happens in breathing as the end result of breathing once you have inhaled this is the fate of the oxygen that you have taken in and the carbon dioxide is also coming out through your nostrils in this direction from the blood into the alveoli from there uh, in the reverse direction through your trachea through the larynx through the pharynx and out through your nostrils okay and how does oxygen transport occur in the human body of course uh, it is the red blood cells remember i have already told you analogies to remember this uh, the red blood cells taking up the role of the taxi or the cab hemoglobin which acts like the cab driver to pick up the uh, passengers oxygen and carbon dioxide respectively right so oxygen uh, from the lungs are picked up by the hemoglobin in the red blood cells oxygen bonds to hemoglobin and finally once the blood has flowed and reached target cells in the body oxygen gets released into the tissue cells okay guys so we are left with two more life processes but before that i think it's time to take a quick break do remember we are nearing the end of academic year so it's not late yet it's better late than never is all that i have to tell you so here is your golden opportunity to learn through unlimited live classes with fun and high level quizzes and you get to compete with students throughout the world and know your strengths and weaknesses and of course on vedantu's platform you get to have access to interactive replays with live quizzes and leaderboards i don't think there can be anything better than this right interactive replays are definitely amazing so even if you do miss out on any of the sessions you can watch the replay and at the same time when it when i say interactive that means you can also participate in those quizzes okay and of course after every single session you get to download premium handwritten notes from your master teachers and a lot of other content doubt solving session assignments chapter assignments chapter tests and what not to give you enough practice so children you get to choose from 5000 plus micro courses that are available and also free crash courses to complete your preparation children those of you who are registered for vedantu pro get this as part of it you don't have to do anything extra to get access to these okay so we believe that less is more because the more classes you take lesser the pricing would be as in the more classes you subscribe to lesser would the price be how exactly well you will get to know once you click on the uh, description box click on the link in the description box and the pinned comment just apply the coupon code ambpro okay so let let us do the math also for you here a one month of pro subscription would normally cost you 2159 so children do remember this cost is for all your subjects together your six subjects together when i say six subjects it means physics chemistry biology maths english and social studies everything together for approximately 200 sessions you end up paying 2699 normally but applying the coupon code ambpro reduces it to 2159 okay for three months after application of the coupon code ambpro you can avail it at 5599 okay and for 6 months which means for a longer term subscription you will end up paying 9199 with discounts from amb pro well i know some of you might still be confused so here i have done the entire math for you when i say 2159 is it reasonable or not so here is your answer 2159 for 200 sessions would mean it's coming down to rupees 11 per session right and then 5599 for 600 sessions would mean rupees 9 per session that's it and 9199 for 1200 sessions in 6 months would mean just rupees 8 per session well children this is because vedantu strongly believes in making education affordable and accessible to all of course the youtube platform is also there but we also want to give you a lot more personalized content and that is exactly what this these courses will be able to 
give you okay to make you a better uh, individual to make you um, make your preparation complete that is what it aims at so definitely don't even think twice because the pricing that i have told you is even ending up being less pricey than your favorite chocolate bar or your favorite packet of chips so why do you even have to think twice about it at a time when education is becoming more and more expensive in the world today something like this is available to you in such reasonably priced manner so certainly make use of it children okay just remember the coupon code ambpro all right okay so continuing now with the next life process which is transportation okay now children by the way do click on the like button right now if you have been enjoying this and if you have been finding it useful because quick 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 revisions i i am actually imagining like sitting with you and making you revise the entire chapter and that is why i'm doing all this so fast okay so click on the like button if you have found this useful and this way of uh, having this series one shot series useful even if you have any feedback please feel free to post it in the comment section below so that in the upcoming sessions we can try and incorporate uh, changes according to what you need as well okay all right so coming to transportation we know there has to be a well defined transportation system in organisms to transport nutrients gases and waste matter there are different blood cells for our circulatory system which are rbcs wbcs and platelets red blood cells white blood cells and platelets red blood cells to carry oxygen white blood cells to act as uh, okay so let me just write that um gas transport especially oxygen transport uh white blood cells uh, acting as soldiers so i'll just write defense here yes and platelets to help in blood clotting these are the major functions of these three and this is the structure of the human heart i'm sure all of you know this really well by now there are four major chambers the right and left atria the right and left ventricles okay and the valves which are found in between both of them tricuspid here between the right atrium and the right ventricle and the bicuspid uh, or the mitral valve found between the left atrium and the left ventricle here mitral valve or the bicuspid valve okay yes and also remember the different uh, blood vessels associated with the heart arteries carry blood away from the heart veins carry blood towards the heart and the capillaries supply blood to the individual cells and tissues of the body these are the three different kinds of blood vessels in human beings arteries which are very thick walled veins which are relatively thin walled and capillaries which are really really thin walled okay and also remember veins are uh, provided with valves okay whereas arteries don't have valves all right and capillaries are just one cell in thickness so diffusion simple diffusion can easily occur um of substances between the capillaries and your individual cells and tissues so this is the pathway the schematic diagram representing circulation in human beings you just need to go through it once children and my suggestion is just make use of uh, this flow chart um and not just copy it down just close your eyes have a pen and paper ready with you think about how your heart functions and from your memory work out a flow chart like this do this about 3 4 times or 5 6 times even 10 times if at all you keep getting it wrong and ultimately you will certainly get it right just teach it to yourself from your memory that is the best way of learning circulation in humans otherwise just by looking at this chart multiple times it may not necessarily help you so all uh, all that you need to keep in mind is that arteries carry blood away from the heart veins carry blood towards the heart and also remember pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation okay so this is what you need to keep in mind and this is the con the entire concept of double circulation pulmonary circuit and systemic circuit because pulmonary because your heart and lungs share a very very special bond and systemic circuit would include the circuit between your heart and the different parts of your body all right so this is what we mean by double circulation okay so now coming to the lymphatic system which is also important for you to know just you just need to know the basics this is also a parallel kind of circulatory system that you have 
uh, what it does is if you remember i have told you the blood which flows through the blood vessels in your body at uh, such a high under such high pressure there are chances that some of that fluid might ooze out through the tiny pores in the blood vessel walls when that happens all that fluid gets randomly accumulated in tissue spaces around your blood vessels so lymphatic system is just the solution for that so that the tissue cell doesn't randomly get accumulated in random spaces there are lymphatic capillaries which collect all that fluid and join together to form a lymphatic uh, trunk there are also lymph nodes uh, which are there in different parts of your body um, and ultimately what they do is this fluid is joined back into the normal blood stream okay just like how rivers and the multiple rivers and seas and all of that might somewhere be connected to an entire huge ocean or a huge lake or a huge water body as such lymphatic system is also connected to your uh, regular blood circulatory system okay and uh, just in case you are still confused about this children as i have told you check out the main video in the main playlist uh, in this channel wherein we have discussed this well in detail everything about the lymphatic system what it does how it provides a uh, maintains a role in immunity and all of that okay now coming to uh, transportation in plants there are just two major things you have to know xylem and phloem xylem for water and mineral transport phloem for food transport so root pressure and transpirational pull are the two major forces which help in maintaining a continuous water column in living plants this is how um, food transport happens in phloem okay so these are the different steps of it you can just go through it where does it start if you think of it a uh, food transport always has to start from the kitchen where the food has been produced and that is the um the leaves the kitchen of the plant from there it begins so the cells in the leaf we call it the source cell so always begin your explanation of phloem from the source cell because from there it starts trans it picks up the food that has been produced and with the help of phloem elements which are companion cells and sieve tubes um and all these sieve plates and additional parenchyma fibers and all of that it is able to transport the prepared food to different destinations in the plant body be it in the roots or uh, maybe in upper parts of the plant like other leaves or stems or flowers or fruits wherever it may be phloem is able to transport food all that you have to remember is xylem is unidirectional uh, transports only in one direction and phloem is bidirectional okay moves in the upward and in the lower direction downward direction so sink cell would be the destination so cell would be the leaf because that is where the food is getting picked up from by the phloem okay so this is transport in plants and then comes the last life process which is excretion of course so much happening in the body digestion respiration and circulation of course there has to be a system to get rid of the waste matter that is generated as well right so the organs of excretion in human beings would include primarily the kidneys or the urinary tract as such and the secondary organs of excretion would be the lungs skin and liver lungs for carbon dioxide and water skin for water salt and urea and liver for the excretion of elimination of ammonia all right now you just need to know the structure of the main the primary organs of excretion which are your kidneys there is one pair of kidneys uh, located in the abdominal cavity in human beings and uh, the kidneys open into a couple of a pair of uh, tubular structures called ureters that open into a bladder which opens outside through the urethra and it's also important for you to know the blood vessels which are associated with the kidneys um, which are the renal arteries supplying blood into the kidneys and the renal vein which carries deoxygenated blood away from the kidneys back into your heart okay yes so this is about the human excretory system and uh, remember the nephrons the millions of tiny units called nephrons make up your kidneys and it is in the nephrons that 
uh, urine is ultimately formed. The different parts of the nephron would be the Bowman's capsule and the tubular parts. As you can see here, this is the structure of one single nephron. Okay, so uh, starting with the Bowman's capsule, followed by the tubular parts, the main parts are the PCT, the loop of Henle and the BCT. And this is followed by the collecting duct. Okay, so there are three major uh, steps in urine formation, if you remember, starting with glomerular filtration, wherein um, in the glomerulus, which is the tuft of blood capillaries found inside the Bowman's capsule, the blood enters and then a sort of filtration occurs and whatever is able to pass into the Bowman's capsule passes into it and the rest of it exits the glomerulus. Okay, so this glomerular filtrate enters into the PCT and that undergoes what we call tubular absorption. If you remember the analogy we have discussed here, um, uh, you would remember that I told you glomerular filtration is a stage where I told you that you are cleaning up your room, throwing out all the dump that you don't need. Tubular reabsorption is the step where your mom is coming and examining the things that you have thrown out and she is probably retaking, taking out some things from the trash and saying that, no, no, this is not meant to go into the trash. This is required in the house and taking it back. Likewise, tubular reabsorption is where surrounding blood capillaries uh, reabsorb certain useful substances into the bloodstream this way, primarily from the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, loop of Henle also, some of this occurs and then comes tubular secretion, which is the step where your mom also from the rest of the household, she adds in some more things which can go into the trash. This is tubular secretion wherein your blood capillaries throw in additional wastes into your into the urine which has been formed, okay, uh, such as unwanted, uh, unabsorbed drugs in the body, unwanted medicines or drugs in the body, um, and a lot of other things, maybe anything, anything at all that the body doesn't need at that point of time could possibly exit through tubular secretion to form what we call urine. Okay, and now the urine enters into the collecting duct, depending upon water requirements in your body, water may be reabsorbed or it may not be reabsorbed. Okay, if you need a lot of excess water to be reabsorbed in the body, this step occurs. Otherwise, this may not occur. It just gets eliminated. Okay, so it goes into the renal pelvis, which is the inner part of the kidney, from there into the ureters, urinary bladder, and ultimately eliminated through the urethra. So this is the entire urine formation at one glance for you. Glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, tubular secretion, and water conservation, which happens in the collecting duct. Right, children? So that is about um, excretion and also in plants also. If you want, uh, you can just think about that as well. Uh, a few wastes can get eliminated through a random means, either through vacuoles, shedding of leaves and all of that. So check out our main playlist to have a look at uh, the details of plant excretion as well. Okay, and... Remember to visit the link in the description box below and in the pinned comment. And remember to apply the coupon code AMBPRO, children. Okay. And children, by the way, I think I have told you, I have overloaded you with enough information from the chapter life processes in one shot uh, now. So just in case you need a break, you need a quick a one minute motivation or a quick break, remember to check out my official Instagram page as well, Ambika underscore Vedantu. You can start following me there so that... You can check out on all the posts which keep coming up on a daily basis. A lot of moral stories which we keep posting on a daily basis and a lot of others as well which will benefit you all. Okay, children? And if you have found this session useful, please do remember to click on the like button right now. Share it with all your CBSE class 10 friends. Okay, I'm not giving you a choice. Please share it with all your CBSE class 10 friends because sharing is certainly caring. We want all of you to benefit from these series. And of course, stay subscribed to our channel Vedantu 9th and 10th English because just like one shot, we intend to keep coming up with more useful series for you like uh, previous year's questions and a lot more interesting things waiting for you. So ensure that you do not miss out on any of these updates by clicking on the subscribe button. All right. So until we meet again, stay home, stay happy and stay safe. This is Ambika signing off. Bye bye.